Yesterday's SLS Green Run kind of just encapsulated all of my feelings about the SLS in one day. At first, they accelerated the start of the webcast by almost an hour, only to fill it with complete nonsense and Aerojet Rocketdyne promos. But eventually, they ran out of script, as incessant holds caused by a low pressure in the LH2 tank. But it's important to note that the issues that were responsible for the hold were in no way related to the issues on engine 4 that caused the green run to end 67.9 seconds after RS-25 ignition. When Mission Control announced an MCF or major component failure on engine 4 and very soon after RS-25 shutdown. Now the post-test press conference was not very enlightening. They either didn't have enough answers or were too afraid to say them because a lot of what we got was just the standard, this is why we test. But we did get a couple interesting tidbits. Honeycutt, the director of testing at Stennis, said that the engine problem happened at around T plus 60 seconds, right as they were supposed to be throttling down from 109% thrust on the RS-25s to 95% thrust to simulate the throttle down for max Q. But they noticed a flash in the area of the thermal protection blankets around engine 4 that happened almost simultaneous to the, to the major component failure, which suggests this is in fact a hardware problem and not a software problem. And although they've got spare RS-25 engines hanging around at Stennis, this is still likely going to mean they're going to have to redo the hot fire test because NASA themselves set a 250 second minimum requirement for the SLS to pass this stage of the green run. Although during the press conference, I was actually surprised by Jim Bridenstein and others saying that they were willing to push through and not even require the 250 seconds, instead shipping the core stage directly to KSC. And I think this wouldn't really be the right call. I mean, it's kind of ominous that this test happened on the anniversary of Columbia's ill-fated launch. We really shouldn't be rushing something as expensive and important as the Artemis 1 rocket. But the press conference also had a couple of other gaffes. One NASA engineer said that in his 29 years of working for NASA, a failed green run test was the best moment of his career. Or the fact that this has been the biggest test at Stennis in the last 50 years. I think both of these statements are really a testament to the lack of ambition NASA has shown over the past decades and not really a reflection about today's green run test. Although one thing that will certainly be missed about today is Jim Bridenstine. This was likely his last really public official appearance for NASA and as usual he was taking the charge to defend NASA's flagship program. When some wanted to end the conference because of the cold, he told reporters that he was here for them and that he wanted to answer any questions as they came in, which I think is just a really good thing to do and was especially important as there was a complete lack of information about the test. Jim Bridenstine has really become almost a cult-like figure in the spaceflight community and it's really easy to see why. After a decade of stagnation, he really showed people that NASA could be bold and innovative and actually take people to space. I mean, he's done so much in such a short amount of time, and especially when you consider the partisanship that surrounded his appointment to NASA. I mean, you even saw people like Marco Rubio saying that they thought they should have a scientist and not a politician in charge of the agency. But it turns out, Bridenstine is exactly what NASA needed. He brought a sense of partnership between government and private entities like NASA really hasn't seen. He's also spearheaded the expansion of the Artemis program to international partners, making the program harder to kill and more resilient, while also speeding up the Artemis program by four years and ensuring that private companies have a stake in the program by privatizing HLS and creating the commercial lunar payload services. Again, Bridenstein has really revolutionized the way NASA interacts with the private sector and he's also done a great job at PR. He's interviewed with online celebrities like Tim Dodd, the everyday astronaut, and he's appeared in tons of webcasts over the COVID-19 pandemic. And it's a little sad he didn't get to end his administration on a high note. And I'm also interested to see where he goes after NASA. Some people have said he should work with governmental relations at SpaceX, 
and it's likely he eventually takes some form of a private sector job. But in the meantime, I hope he takes a little time to unwind and get some well-deserved rest. But there is no such luck for those working on the SLS. They've got a hard deadline of less than a year since they've already started solid rocket booster stacking at the KSC and that means that they have less than a year until the O-rings in between the booster segments start to degrade enough that they can't be reused. So I think we're going to see around the clock work on the SLS to try to diagnose the problem and take what steps are necessary to correct it. We've seen a timeline of about 10 days floated for a quick recycle if it's found to be a minor problem to a longer period of around 30 days to a couple months if it's a severe problem. But I think there is still a slight chance of a 2021 launch, and if not, sometime in 2022 is a more likely scenario. At the end of the day, this has been quite a failure for the SLS, and more specifically the RS-25 engine, which has been seen as a really reliable engine, with in-flight shutdowns of the engine happening only once or twice during the shuttle era. But I have found some problems with the way the media has treated this failure, with Eric Berger calling this the first real test of the SLS rocket, which I think is just simply untrue. They've had seven previous steps of the green run that they've all passed successfully, and multiple wet dress rehearsals that were mentioned in the press conference. I think it's important to note the progress that SLS has made, and while it's been slow, Remember that the original moon landing proposal had the SLS finally landing on the moon in 2028. While there's obviously tons of valid criticisms for the SLS, I've just kind of become exhausted by all of it, and I just want this thing to finally launch. I wish everyone working on the SLS the best of luck, and hopefully the issue isn't as severe as some might think it is, and we don't see yet another massive delay in the SLS program. This is Cost Plus Content, Bidding Jim Bridenstine farewell and signing off.